Hello, Wilson Wildcats. It's your principal, Miss McGee. First off, I would like to say I hope everyone is doing well and is staying healthy and safe by practicing social distancing and staying at home. Each week during the school closure, a Wilson staff member will come to you with a read aloud. I'm going to kick things off today by reading the story called Harvesting Hope. It's the story of Cesar Chavez, and I'm going to read this today in honor of Cesar Chavez Day. As you can see, I will be reading to you in my pajamas because it's pajama day. So be sure to check out the virtual Spirit Week calendar as well on your teacher's Google Classroom. Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez, written by Kathleen Kroll and illustrated by Yuyu Morales. Here we go. Until Cesar Chavez was 10, every summer night was like a fiesta. Relatives swarmed onto the ranch for barbecues with watermelon, lemonade, and fresh corn. Cesar and his brothers, sisters, and cousins settled down to sleep outside under netting to keep mosquitoes out. But who could sleep? With uncles and aunts spinning, singing ghost stories, and telling magical tales of life back in Mexico. Caesar thought the whole world belonged to his family. The 80 acres of their ranch were an island in the shimmering Arizona desert, and the starry skies were all their own. Many years earlier, Caesar's grandfather had built their spacious adobe house to last forever, with walls 18 inches thick. A vegetable garden, cows and chickens supplied all the food they could want. With hundreds of cousins on nearby farms, there was always someone to play with. Caesar's best friend was his brother Richard, and they never spent a day apart. Caesar was so happy at home that he was a little afraid when school started. On the first day, he grabbed the seat next to his older sister, Rita. The teacher moved him to another seat, and Caesar flew out the door and ran all the way home. He took three days of coaxing for him to return to school and take his place with the other first graders. Caesar was stubborn, but he was not a fighter. His mother cautioned her children against fighting, urging them to use their minds and their mouths to work out conflicts. Then, in 1937, the summer Caesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for the crops, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills. There came a day when Caesar's mom couldn't stop crying. In a daze, Caesar watched his father strap their possessions onto the roof of their old car. After a long struggle, the family no longer owned the ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Caesar's old life had vanished. Now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. When the Chavez family arrived at the first of their new homes in California, they found a battered old shed. Its doors were missing and garbage covered the dirt floor. 
Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes. They shared water and outdoor toilets with a dozen other families, and overcrowding made everything filthy. Neighbors were constantly fighting, and the noise upset Caesar. He had no place to play his games with Richard. Meals were sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered along the road. Caesar swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Yanking out beets broke the skin between his thumb and index fingers. Grapevines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. Lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with a short-handled hole would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family talked constantly of saving enough money to buy back their ranch. But by each sundown, the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for the day's work. As the years blurred together, they spoke of the ranch less and less. The towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade only signs were displayed in many stores and in the restaurants. None of the 35 schools Caesar attended over the years seemed like a safe place either. Once, after Caesar broke the rule about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. He came to hate school because of the conflicts, though he liked to learn. Even he considered his eighth grade graduation a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. His lack of schooling embarrassed Caesar for the rest of his life. But as a teenager, he just wanted to put food on his family's table. As he worked, it disturbed him that the landowners treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. So like other migrant workers, Caesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders showed up to try to help. How could they know about feeling so powerless? Who could battle such odds? <clears throat> Yet Caesar had not forgotten his old life in Arizona and the jolt he felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be this miserable. Reluctantly, he started paying attention to the outsiders. He began to think that maybe there was some hope. And in his early 20s, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. One by one, this was how he started. At the first meeting, Caesar organized a dozen women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner. After 20 minutes, everyone started wondering when the organizer would show up. Caesar thought he might die of embarrassment. 
Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and the mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure they did so out of pity. But despite his shyness, Caesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate. With landowners, he was stubborn, demanding, and single-minded. Single -minded. He was learning to become a fighter. In a fight for justice, he told everyone truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It meant using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. One night, 150 people poured into an old abandoned theater in Fresno. At this first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Caesar unveiled its flag, a bold black eagle, the sacred bird of the Aztec Indians. La Cosa, the cause, was born. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano, here in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley. Brilliant green vineyards reached towards every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. Then in 1965, the vineyard owners cut their pay even further. Caesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful that the others would get the message. As plump grapes drooped, Thousands of workers walked off that company's fields in a strike. Grapes, when ripe, do not last long. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Caesar refused to respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Cosa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capital in Sacramento to ask for the governor's help. Caesar and, 70, Caesar and 67 others started out one morning. Their first obstacle was the Delano Police Force, 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous marchers headed north under the sizzling sun. Their, their rallying cry was, Si se puede or yes, it can be done. The first night they reached Ducor. The marchers slept outside the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Single file, they continued covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley while the unharvested grapes in Delano turned white with mold. Caesar developed painful blisters right away. He and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. When the sun set, marchers lit candles and kept going.
Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the march, one speaker shouted. That light, our cause for all farm workers to see what is happening here. Another cried, we seek our basic God-given rights as human beings. Viva la cosa. Eager supporters would keep the marchers up half the night talking about change. Every morning, the line of marchers swelled. Caesar always took the lead. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long peaceful march was a shock to people unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered help. For the grape company, the publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Caesar's 38th birthday. Two days later, 5,000 people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. That evening, Caesar received a message that he was sure was a prank. But in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all through the night to a mansion in wealthy Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with a pay raise and better conditions. Caesar rushed back to join the march. On Easter Sunday, when the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10,000 people strong. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Cesar Chavez had just signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. The parade erupted into a giant fiesta. Crowds swarmed the steps, some people cheering and many weeping. Prancing horses carried men in mariachi outfits. Everyone sang and waved flowers or flags. They made a place of honor for the 57 marchers who had walked the entire journey. Speaker after speaker, addressing the audience in Spanish and in English, took the microphone. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer, cried one. You cannot pretend that we do not exist. The crowd celebrated until the sky was full of stars. The march had taken its toll on Caesar's legs. His legs were swollen and he was running a high fever. Gently, he reminded everyone that the battle was not over. It is well to remember that there must be courage, but also in victory, there must be humility. Much more work lay ahead, but the victory was stunning. Some of the wealthiest people in the country had been forced to recognize some of the poorest as human beings. Cesar Chavez had won this fight without violence, and he would never be powerless again. And that is the end of Harvesting Hope. I hope you enjoyed this story and take some time today to think about 
the sacrifices and the contributions of Cesar Chavez and what he means to America today. Thank you. See you soon, Wildcats. I'm missing you. Be safe and take care. Bye-bye.